Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. I, I, I've grown to love Seattle. I've been out here a few times now. Um, what I'm going to do, of course, talk about typography and how it has been part of my work. And uh, before I do that, before I talk anything about design, I just want to talk a little bit about my entire career and some of the experiences that I've had along the way. What you're looking at here is the beginning of my, well, it's my uh, homepage on my website. But this is the work experience that I've had starting in school at Pratt and going up to that 68, which is the Olympics. And uh, I've had quite a bit of experience since then. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about everything. So I'm going to show the things that are near and dear to my heart. And of course, the Olympics is uh, a big part of that. So if you'll indulge in that, I just love to explain some of the things that happened. And in fact, I, I have to say something. I, in New York, I was invited to speak at the Type Directors Club. And I went over and I, th I said, you know, I, God, I studied industrial design. I don't even really know that much about it. I, I felt very uh, insecure. And I don't know that much about typography, really. And they said, well, what the hell is Mexico 68? And I, I've, oh my God. So there's a whole other angle that I've come at typography from. And I'd like to talk about that because it has to do with, uh, of course, branding. And it has to do with the third dimension. So, OK. Now, I have my studio in Manhattan, um, right, right across from the Museum of Natural History, that central uh, circle. I went to school in Brooklyn. And I grew up in Kearney, which isn't that far from Manhattan. I was born in Newark, New Jersey. So I'm, I'm kind of a local boy in the area. Um, one of the people in my life, and I'm, you know, all of us that are in the creative arts have probably had experiences that have been not only memorable, but very helpful as far as uh, things that we do in our, our profession and in our careers. My grandfather was my favorite guy in the family. And he was an engineer on the Lackawanna Railroad. And um, he, well, this is me when I was about, I don't know, three, four years old. And that's him after he was retired. He told me a lot of stories. Now, he was out west. He was in the Spanish-American War. He was out west after that to kind of cool it. And he was out there when Billy the Kid, of all people, were out there. And he actually met Pat Garrett, the guy that shot Billy the Kid. So OK, I got all of these stories. And of course, I didn't know anything about design then. So uh, I wanted to be, that's him. And uh, of course, I wanted to be a cowboy. <laughs> OK, I was the kid in class that could draw. I imagine a lot of you had that same experience. My father was a fisherman. And I spent a lot of time out on the Atlantic. And uh, any of you that are, and you're very close to the water here too, so you know the aesthetic that comes off the sea or that type of, uh, uh, you know, kind of no-nonsense aesthetic is quite beautiful. The compasses, the rope, the knots, and all of that. And that was really important for me. I, I, I had a lot of that, and it has made a big impression in my early life. I did a lot of work in uh, factories. I paid my way through college by working in factories. My dad was, uh, he was Second World War and he became alcoholic and I didn't really have uh, a dad in my young life. So my mom, I, my, he, she raised me. So we were fairly poor. So the, working in the factories was really helpful as far as getting me through college and so forth. Um, I really liked the rams, and I like them because of their helmets. So this is probably one of the first, uh, I was like 14, 13, 14, 15 years old, and I just love this helmet. And uh, not only that, I love Bob Waterfield. Uh, they had Crazy Legs Hirsch, they had Bob Waterfield, he was the quarterback. And I wanted Bob Waterfield's autograph, so I had an idea. I thought, I knew Bob Waterfield was married to uh, Jane Russell, so I, I drew a picture of Jane, and I sent it to Jane. And I didn't hear anything for about six or eight months. And I thought, well, I tried. Then I got a letter. Isn't that, isn't that lovely? And you know, it's these, these things are like epiphany moments. She said, thank you so much for the sketch. Your work shows definite promise. All of a sudden, I like Jane, but also I got Bob's uh, <laughs> autograph also. I did sports. I, I, I did football. I did basketball. I did boxing. And uh, my boxing career, I was in a boys club and it lasted, I remember, exactly four fights. And as you get better, you get in with better guys. And I was doing pretty well and I got in with a better guy in my fourth fight. And I really nailed him. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting on the seat of my pants. He hit me with a counterpunch. 
So I, I figured there must be something better than this. Um, <laughs> I'm not so sure I made the right decision, but uh, um, I ran for, this is my first poster actually. <laughs> And my spelling is bad, but I actually misspelled uh, uh, pants that way, you know, intentionally. <laughs> anyway, I won. I had no idea what I was getting into. It was more, in my mind, it was more of a popularity context. And all of a sudden, I won. And I had to get up on stage and conduct every Friday the uh, assembly for the whole school. And I remember the first time I got behind one of these lecterns, and my knees were banging so hard that I actually had bruises on my knees. So I got over that early on, so here I am. Now, as I mentioned, I, I, I didn't have uh, a lot of tutoring and so forth as a kid, and I had no idea of college. I mean, I just really didn't think about it. My family couldn't afford it, and I was president, and I got interviewed, and uh, they asked me what I was gonna do. Now, everybody else was going to college, to West Point, and so forth. So I got clever. I said, well, I, I, I like art, and I'm gonna follow my art. And then I read this and I thought, that looks pretty good. <laughs> so I did. And I wound up getting into Pratt. And that's where the factories came in. I, I, you know, I could work the summers in factories. And actually, at that time, you can't do that now, pay for my tuition. So one of the things that happened at Pratt, um, I studied industrial design. They didn't teach graphic design in the uh, undergraduate courses at that time. It was just coming over from Europe, graphic design, as we know it now, and I guess it started more in Switzerland than any place for us, besides the Bauhaus House before that. But anyway, General Motors had instigated their first uh, student program, a summer program, and they, they chose me. They came around to the different schools in the country, and they, they chose one student from each industrial design school and from advertising uh, at that time. But they did have a graphic design. They were smart enough to actually have a graphic design program. So I went out to General Motors. That's the, uh, the new, well, at that time, it was a new tech center out in um, Warren, Michigan. And that arrow is where the offices were. So I went out, and I was part of uh, a group from all over the country. And it was, it was really... It was a turning point in my career. First of all, uh, Pratt was difficult for me because I had no training in uh, art before going there. Not that a lot of people didn't. But also, they were a very stylized school, and I really couldn't get into that. So I didn't have a great time with a lot of the professors. And then when GM came around and they chose me, I thought, wow, this is like, uh, wow. So I went out, and uh, I, met a, I met a student from, from Yale who was studying with Paul Rand, and they did have, at a graduate level, graphic design. So it was my first introduction to graphic design. I absolutely fell in love with what they were doing at Yale, and I went back to Pratt, and then after Pratt, I graduated. This was between my junior and senior year at General Motors. I graduated from Pratt, and uh, General Motors hired me back, and I developed, I designed the, uh, the Delco symbol for all the Delco parts and um, had a dose of uh, systemizing. Thank God for my industrial design training. I, I did a uh, packaging system that served 1,200 different packaging sizes and shapes and so forth. So this was uh, quite an experience. It was so much of an experience that I had to go in the military and I didn't want to go back to General Motors. I had enough of that. <laughs> it's very funny. So there I go, I'm in the military and um, the uh, experience I had there, I was in the fire direction center, uh, and I did a lot of work on maps. So I had no idea at that point that, I, that this would be very useful in whatever I'd be doing in the rest of my life when I got out. I got out, and uh, everything was slow in New York then. I didn't want to go back to the General Motors, as I mentioned, um, but I didn't have any other work. So uh, they, there was a small office in Detroit, and I got hired there. I went in and I found that they were doing um, a show in Zagreb, Yugoslavia. So I got hired to do the graphics. So this is me in Zagreb after I got out of the military. And this was another one of those epiphany experiences. Um, the theme of the show was for the Department of Commerce. It was at a trade fair. And the theme of the show was um, in, um, construction use of leisure time. And uh, I, I took the idea of time being the hourglass and day and nighttime activity, and that was the logo. Now, Detroit was really full of beans at that time, so I suggested when we were designing it that we do an entry gate based on this. 
we designed it, we built it. You know, I mean, it was like, this is the biggest thing I've ever done. And also, we, we vacuum formed the logo, uh, shipped it over to Zagreb, and did um, a fence around the whole site. So I was into taking graphics and going into the third dimension quite early in my career. After that, uh, things did loosen up in New York. We had the, uh, the World's Fair, and I got hired by uh, Irving Harper, actually, at the George Nelson office. That's George and um, to do the graphics for the Chrysler Pavilion at the World's Fair. Now, the pavilion was an interesting site. It was not just a building. They had like uh, five different buildings. So uh, all of a sudden, I was involved with something that was uh, kind of wayfinding without even knowing it even existed. So I developed a, um, a pointing fingered hand and for two reasons. One, it was, I made a VIP button out of it, so all the kids, it was for children, I should mention that. The, uh, the whole Chrysler Pavilion was for children. And when they entered the pavilion, we gave them a VIP that they could wear. And it was great because it got all over the whole fair site in New York uh, with the VIP button. And then I experimented with how do you get people to these five different uh, pavilions on the site. And uh, that's what we did with the hand for that. So I really got into wayfinding in a very early time. Now, the factory work that I had done earlier really became very handy because they had things that uh, the whole point was to explain to children how cars were made and so forth. And they had a, a production line ride. And uh, I thought, well, you know, cars are made in dangerous places. Why don't we do safety posters for the kids too? So I did these. And then Howard Miller picked it up as a product, and I, I continued working on these when I, after the fair. And it's all based on this little kind of work guy, and I put him through all the things that you have to be careful of at uh, you know, any kind of a factory. Uh. Mm -hmm. And here, this is me at, at George Nelson's office, and these are the posters. They were safety posters. They were called Pronto posters. And big companies like DuPont, they had them in all their factories. So that was a, a very interesting experience. Another experience of doing something graphic and systemizing it, making a system out of it. Now, it was during this period that um, I, one of the fellows that I worked with at the Nelson office had a brother studying at the Royal College. And he said, you know, if you're going over, I was going to, I was going to go over for a vacation to London. He said, I want you to meet my brother. So I met his brother. And it was during that period at the Royal College that I met Peter Murdoch, who had just graduated, uh, and he had a choice of going any place. He had won a scholarship for one year of going any place and doing whatever he wanted, and he wanted to come to New York. And when Peter heard I worked for George Nelson, he, he majored in furniture design, we became instant buddies. So he came to New York, and Peter and I got on very well, and this was his uh, chair, and um, I worked with him as he developed this into um, a product. And at that time, I was thinking of doing something else besides continuing to work with the Nelson office. So we were going to start an office. Well, one of the fellows I worked with at the Nelson office had worked on the Mexican pavilion um, at the New York Fair. And then he came over and worked at the Nelson office. So I found out through him that there was going to be a uh, competition to do the graphics for the Olympics. So we took this fellow, his name is Eduardo Terrasas, and took him to dinner and got on the list. And what he was going to do, uh, it's a long drawn out story. If you want to hear it, ask a question later on, because I don't want to keep you here with all of this. But anyway, Peter and I, and that's Peter and myself, and Neil and my wife, uh, everything in my life seemed to happen in 1966. And Neil, we just got married, and all of a sudden, we're going to Mexico with one-way tickets because it was a competition. So we had one week, no, we had two weeks, actually, to do something. And if we didn't do something, we went back to New York. And we didn't have tickets to go back to New York. So we kind of mandated ourselves to do something or have a problem. Neil and I were married. Uh, we're still married. In fact, uh, in less than a month, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary. So, yeah. <laughs> So, okay, we go to Mexico. Now, uh, you know, this is back in 1966, and computers weren't very prevalent then. So everything we did was um, by hand, and I still keep my, my drawing tools in a, a jar. 
And this is actually the first sketch where, where I realized that I could take the geometry of the five rings and develop it into the five, I mean, develop it into the year of the event, the 68. And this is actually taking that discovery or thinking I had a discovery and making it work. At first, I didn't like it um, because I couldn't separate the 68, right? This is actually true. So, okay, this is the beginning, the 68 based on the rings like I just showed you. And then I thought, well, I can make letters out of this too. So I made letters for Mexico and did not like the way they looked with the 68, did not like the 68 because I couldn't separate it and it would still fit with the rings. So then I realized that I had discovered something. Uh, I, I discovered a ligature face, really. It's a ligature face. And when you put it together, it had a nice eloquence, elo elegant quality to it, except it was a pain in the neck. I overlapped it two strokes, all the letters. If it didn't work two strokes, I adjusted it visually. But it had a nice quality to it, but it was really a pain in the neck to clear out what the spaces had to be cleared out to make it work. So I figured that out, and that's it. You know? And that's actually the whole process uh, of, of getting to this point. Now, at this time, just before going to Mexico, they had the Op Art Show, where they had Bridget Riley and a lot of the people that did a lot of extremely active things with flat graphics, and that was very helpful. So I let the geometry just start doing its thing, and, you know. And of course, this became the poster for the Olympics in Mexico, and it's a very, a very famous uh, image. Now, the other thing that this is based on, when I first went to Mexico, and this, is a, this was a real lesson for me. I learned something in Yugoslavia, uh, you know, that you can, people in different places do things differently, and you can still get things done and do good things. So when I went to Mexico, um, I spent a lot of time at the Museum of Anthropology and discovered they had cultures there, some of the early cultures, that did absolutely beautiful things. They had some of the best designers that probably lived any place at any time. So this is just a very simple body stamp um, made out of clay, but you can see the, 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 the lineal structure and the kind of expansion and so forth is just embodied in that. And then of course you have things uh, from the folk art now, the Huichol Indians, and uh, they're still doing this. And that's made out of wool. So in other words, what they did was take a board or take any object and cover it with wax and then push wool into it, into patterns. So literally, it's the same thing we were doing with the, uh, the Mexico 68. So it had a Mexican look to it. And I think when the Mexico 68 was established, people started coming into the office. We, Peter and I were there for about almost five weeks. And I had to go into the architect in charge and say, Arquitecto, que pasa? You know, what's, what's happening? We, did, we win? did we win? You know, because two weeks, we, didn't, we weren't sent home. He said, oh, I guess so, very Mexican. So then I said, well, we, you know, we have an apartment in New York. We got to go back and close it and everything. So that was it. I mean, that was the Mexican story. So, okay, we did bring Huicholi uh, Indians, a man and wife, in to the, to the same museum, the Museum of Anthropology. And what we did, they were making their, uh, their pieces, um, but we also gave them boards, and I silkscreened the 68, and then let them do whatever they wanted. And uh, this was really lovely. We, we got quite a few of these, and it was nice to see empathically what they did with color. And this was helpful to get into the spirit of color. I mean, color in Mexico are kind of the same. So with the structure of the 68 and the Mexico 68, it was possible to do a program that was extremely colorful without really changing the forms of anything. And you can see in the, in the foreground here, every week we had a publication and the, the top uh, ban, banner on that was always a different color. So, and of course we had a lot of publications. The publications department became its own entity. I kept my staff, uh, there were about five of us throughout the whole uh, program. I, I find I work effectively in a small group. I radiated everything. I had to do a series of stamps on a lot of diverse uh, subject matter, so I just radiated everything. It was, looked like it was part of the program. It was very helpful in that sense. And of course, we did radiate everything. This is the entrance um, exit areas of the stadium. 
very large scale. And these things were absolutely beautiful when you flew into the city and saw these different installations. Now you can see here, you can see the pencil lines. I mean, this would be a no-brainer to make a, 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 you know, a large print and put it up as a billboard. They had to paint it. And uh, I was so impressed with these people. I mean, they just had such beautiful, beautiful uh, visual skills. Julia's wife, uh, I mean, Peter's wife, Julia Murdoch, uh, came over eventually, and uh, I worked very closely with her to adapt the graphics to the, um, to the uniforms. This has just been put into the permanent collection at MoMA in New York, this whole series of uh, uniforms that we did. So, I mean, this still looks good. And then also, uh, I worked very closely with Eduardo, the, the fellow that I initially worked with in New York, and we did the, uh, the Mexican pavilion for the Trienal in Milan, Italy. And the idea here, I wanted to just take a print of the Mexico 68 expanding, do a mirror image on the wall, and just connect them on the walls. So that, that's it. And that's the model we did, and that's the actual pavilion when you looked in. I mean, this is really, I think it's one of the nicest uh, experiences I've had as far as doing a, taking type, typography and putting it into the third dimension. Now, I'll mention briefly some of the things because I don't really separate typography and iconography. I, I see it all as basic communication and they work very well together or they don't and you can eliminate one and use the other. So it's always a matter of what, the, you know, what are you trying to solve that uh, dictates what you use to solve the problem. We developed a series of icons. Um, now what we did, we focused on a part of the human body or a piece of equipment for each of the icons. This is track and field. When the event took place in water, we made that part of the icon environment and then expressed uh, what the event was. Now, here's another thing. Now this, I have to say, Ramitas Vasquez, he's actually the architect who designed the, um, the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico. Um, I guess I have to tell you some of the history of this. The Olympics were brought to Mexico the first time to a Latin country, Latin American country, by Lopez Mateos. He was a former president of Mexico, very into sports. He brought the Olympics, and during the process of organizing, he was the chairman of the Olympic Committee. He got very ill, he went into a coma, and he eventually died, and they made Ramitas Vasquez the chairman, and he was the guy that did the Mexican Pavilion in New York, who Eduardo worked with. And when he went back to Mexico, he designed, uh, his office designed the uh, Museum of Anthropology. Now, this is where our success really, uh, I mean, my contribution was important, but what he did, and he always did it, and when he did a Mexican pavilion at an international trade fair, you'd go to that, and he did it in New York at the World's Fair. You'd go to it, and you're in a very contemporary environment, very contemporary architecture but you knew you were at a Mexican event or a Mexican structure. And I just loved the way he did that. And we did it for the Olympic Games. And he had started, before I went down, with a group of students uh, using uh, the image of the glyph systems that came out of some of the early cultures to develop the icons. And some of the icons were already started using this system. I did around 90% of these, but that was really the impetus that really made the program so, so Mexican. And you can see here. Now, another thing that was going on at that period, I mean, working on the Olympics, yes, you have an international audience, you try to eliminate language. We had to work with three languages. We had to work with Spanish, of course, we had to work with French, and we had to work with English. So any, we had actually three publications, one in each of those languages, but when you did a sign that had any language on it or a ticket, you had to have the three languages. So we tried, excuse me, but we tried to get rid of all uh, written words as much as possible. So as a result of using the icons, the uh, Olympics was a, a natural, but when later on and even during the Olympics, when you mentioned doing icons, people would say, that's for illiterate people. And I, I really learned that you can do a lot of messaging very, very effectively with icons in this program and the Metro, that, which I'll show you in a little while. So, no, that was back then. So it's always been a pretty hard sell from that point. Now, you know, we used icons without words in the streets. Now we all use icons in everything we do. I mean, we're all probably sick of icons because 
we navigate our virtual reality with icons and people, you don't think they're for illiterate people anymore and I don't think anyone in the world does so they become a real part of our environment and I was really lucky because I got into it early and I did a lot of systems based on if they work, use them and try to make people realize they work. So we developed a cultural program of icons. Uh, I'll just take a little sidetrack here because you know everything has been really fun to do up to this point. During the time, just before the Olympics in Mexico, uh, they had a student revolution. And one of the symbols that we did was for peace. And uh, not only in Mexico were there problems, but um, Martin Luther King was assassinated and I was working during the program uh, when that happened. And the Mexican government asked me to do a, uh, a stamp. They were actually the first government in the world to issue a memorial stamp for King. And um, I was, happened to be there and I did it. So I'm very, very proud of that. The students were using uh, the images that we developed for the Olympics out in the street as anti-government posters. And you can see um, a lot of these images uh, are still recorded. There were a lot more than this. I wish there were better records of them. These are, this is all student uh, work. I gave a talk at the University of Mexico in 1986. And I have to tell you, this was, this was one of those weird experiences. I'm working for the government. I wasn't that much older than the students. I was 29 at that point. And I felt, I guess the best way to describe it, I felt dirty, you know? I mean, I, I didn't want to be working for the government when they were out killing kids. There were over 500 students killed during the uprising down there. And uh, at the university, the, the professor in charge of the uh, program that I was lecturing to uh, gave me this book. And um, he thanked me, a very special thanks. He said, um, I want to thank you for giving us and giving me personally, I was one of the students out in the street making these posters, a language, a graphic language, a visual language that we could be anti-government with. And it was like a weird experience. I got very emotional. I had a hard time talking after he said that. It was like having something lifted off my back. I felt like I was, I was participating. I, I wasn't just there not doing anything. You really couldn't do anything. I could have quit and went home or something, but I didn't. And now this is the uh, logo for the memorial of Tlatiloco, which is where all the students, uh, most of them were, were killed. So I, the, the rings are gone, but now I brought the, uh, the dove back and I hope, uh, I hope this one sticks. Now other things, I'll just briefly touch on a couple of things here. I used a, a, a technique that the Greeks used, um, the silhouette, and uh, I did a series of postage stamps, one for each of the 19 events, and designed the stamp. So if you took the stamp and put it next to itself, the action went through the whole thing. Now the silhouettes were, were important. They became a part of the, uh, the Olympic graphic environment. Um, and I used them. I want to just come back to this a little bit because I mentioned before that um, I, I tried not to use any language. And we developed a silhouette language to get people of a very, very mixed language grouping um, to get to their seats. And we did it with silhouettes. So on the ticket, for example, all the tickets were color coded. The 14th of October would be an olive green. The symbol for the track and field was the only way that track and field was called out. The only words were used were Mexico 68, the event, Estadio 68, where the event was, and then the dates and numbers and so forth. Um, and then you see the blue area on the ticket is where you'd find your seat, the entrance gate, the row of seats, and the seat. And when you get to the entrance, entrance 13 would be marked in the blue entrance to the stadium. These worked, and they worked very well. And I'm, I'm surprised that there's not more done in this vein. I've not really had a chance to do that much more. It's so pure, in such a pure way as this, but we didn't have any complaints, and we didn't really use a lot of words on, on the tickets. Okay, that's the Olympics. I stayed in Mexico after the Olympics and had the opportunity to, thank you. I, I hope I didn't give you too much Olympics because I just love that program so much and I love talking about it. And I could, I could stay here for another hour and talk about different details and so forth. But anyway, let's go to the Metro. 
the metro, these, are, these are my early sketches to do a, um, an image, um, identity image for the metro. And um, basically what I did, I took the Zocalo. The Zocalo, since Mexico was a city, way, way back when, when the Aztecs first came and established it, was a, it was a, an island on a lake and they, it was a square shape that they developed it into. And I took the square of the Zocalo and then cut into it the uh, three lines of the inauguration, um, three lines of the metro, making the M for the metro. Rounding that upper right-hand corner off was um, something that was very, very useful. Um, I developed a typography based on the form of the uh, metro, and what I wanted to do was keep, keep it a very geometric, extremely geometric. There was microgramma, which was not geometric, it was a rounded corner type of uh, face, the Italian face microgramma. And um, I was aware of that, but uh, I really wanted to do something that was more, I don't know, architectural if you want it, and something that would work in uh, the sign banding and so forth, where I could go very large uh, as was allowed on the banding uh, sizes. So that's the typeface, and that's what it's based on. The M itself, uh, we use the color orange because all of the, um, the trains are orange. They still, they still keep this tradition going. Now this is where the rounded corner became really important. It gave me a background shape um, for the uh, icons. We developed icons for all the stations. Now this is, this is where it was a little difficult because they, when I had the idea and I thought, uh, I suggested it and they said, what, what do you want people to think we're a bunch of illiterates here? We're going to put icons on the stations. And I went through a pretty elaborate presentation to show them how on signs, how historically they would bring, it was like excavating uh, history in the city. People that lived there could learn about their city. People that visited could know more about the city and so forth. And it worked and we did it and the system still has, you know, it still hangs in there. This gives you an idea of some of the uh, relationships of the icons. This was the first line and the crossing of the blue and the green lines. So there you see the blue and green and this was the first map that we did and uh, it was just literally lining up the uh, icons and that became really I, I think the most important thing that allowed the system to uh, still be in use because they still put these line maps in the cars when you're on the train and you have an idea of where you want to go and you can describe it if you're from China, you don't have to read anything. You can tell uh, your friend to meet you at the grasshopper station or the, uh, you know. And uh, that was something that I didn't really think it through to that point, but in some of those icons where you couldn't do that, uh, the system doesn't work as well. So anyway, that's the line map. And as I mentioned, the, the, uh, if you're going to Baldera station, you can say I'll meet you at the station with the cannon. And there you can see the name. It uh, really fills in the whole sign band. I never understood, I mean, I've been in SEGD my whole life, it seems now, and there's been a lot of studies on typography and everything. As far as legibility is concerned, th there's never been a problem as far as legibility with, with this face. And I don't know why, to tell you the truth, because a lot of it has to do with ascenders and descenders and, you know, so I, I don't want to study it. it. It's still been going on, and um, I'll show you a little bit more of it later. My daughter, uh, Stacy, was born, so she's officially a, a, a Chilanga. My wife, of course, is from New York, so, but a Chilanga is a girl born in Mexico City. These are my two assistants. Uh, Pancho on the, on the left I brought over from uh, the Olympics. Um, the um, Quinones Arturo uh, was given to me as a translator and he was an architectural engineer. And it was really the three of us that put the th first three lines together and all the signage and everything. Here's the symbols for the first three lines. Now they have 12 lines and they kept up the system. And uh, some of them are good, well, some of mine are good and some of them aren't so good. And that carry, they carry that tradition through, but it works. And I, I'm very proud of this because it's, I think now it's starting to get a lot more uh, attention internationally because, you know, all the, all the maps and so forth are looking the same. And uh, one of the things that I learned in Mexico is that cities are like people. They like to be themselves. And uh, as graphic designers, we can help with that actually. And you can get more support from the city itself if you do it in a way that's sensitive to 
who and what the city is. Here's a good example. This was last year. They had a, uh, an uprising against a, pro a, product, a project that was happening, a big development. And they, they were talking about the, the city stealing the land of the people. Now, the land of the people were these four areas around line one. And they had, they had uh, four of my station icons in a bag that was being taken away by, uh, you know. So there it is. It's part of, it's part of the city. When I came back in 19, I came back to New York in 1971, uh, and uh, I, I made a partnership uh, arrangement with uh, Bill Cannon. Bill, Bill and I worked together at the, um, at the Nelson office, and at that point, he was a vice president, so he left the Nelson office and we started a, uh, a partnership. We worked together for about almost 10 years, and we, we had a lot of wonderful projects during that period. One of the first ones was the, was the, uh, the subway in uh, the metro in Washington, D.C. And uh, my, most of my attention, we did uh, neighborhood maps and we did the system map. And I, I worked very, very uh, closely on the system map um, with um, uh, actually a graduate from Yale, Phil uh, Hard Harding. And we did the, we did the map. And in 19, let's see, 19, it was 2000 and I think 11 or 12, uh, the Metro asked me if I'd uh, come back and add a line to the map coming in from Dulles Airport. It was a, one of those really strange assignments because they didn't want to change the map, but you know these lines were very, very bold because I wanted to put symbols in the lines like in Mex Mexico. We actually planned to do that. And then when they got the Metro up and running, it was so complicated that it was a, we just never got off the ground with it. So I had to thin the lines out a little bit and bring the line in, and they call it the silver line, which I thought was uh, really not so great. I said, yeah, great silver when you have silver ink, but it's gonna be a gray line when you don't have silver ink. I said, why don't you make it, uh, you know, a cherry blossom color or something, you know? And uh, so that, that's what I'm known for, is suggesting that they make it cherry blossom color. If you look at my, <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? So anyway, that's the map. And the map, it got, this was a, actually the, the bottom part and the top part of, a, of the Washington Post uh, talking about the map. And I, I, I mean, this is, I mean, of course, publicity is great, but the thing is, and the one thing that I'd love to do is to get design more understood by the general public. And a lot of my work has really literally been out in the street. And the biggest reward that I've had is being uh, taken in, if you will, by the public and having the work be uh, used in a public way and become part of the urban environment. And uh, that's very, very satisfying. So that's the uh, Washington Post story. Now, one of my really, really favorite programs is in uh, Minnesota. And this was back in 19, I think 1980, 19, yeah, about 1980. And these are early studies for the Minnesota Zoo. And again, typography, I had to bring in the moose and integrated the moose and the M for the zoo. And I, I just love working the third dimension with this. It just had a nice charm to it. <laughs> and then from that, uh, from those forms, again, I developed the, uh, the typography for the zoo, and I use that, well, I use it in different ways. Now, this, this was something that's really important. You know, the idea of synthesis, uh, as we get involved in doing more and more and more graphics and trying to, you know, keep things so you could trademark things and register things and so forth, it gets more and more difficult. And one of the things I found is that you can combine things, synthesize things, and, you know, take two things and make one thing out of it. So. The, the numbers are obvious there, and the different animals that uh, occupied those particular trails are obvious too. So I, I just really like this. I use the same system at the um, Museum of Natural History in New York too, in a different way, uh, but the same approach, and it, it worked very well. Works on maps, works on handouts, works on signs. I also took the arrow and made a, we called it the guide bird, so did a lot of synthesizing. And then the whole, uh, the signage system uh, uses the typography. So it, it keeps it all looking like you're in the zoo. And uh, it was fun doing it. Yeah, the winters out there are fierce. <laughs> I wasn't used to that. 
So, okay, uh, in 1981, yeah, it, it was chosen as one of the 10 best designs in from 1980 or 1981 by Time Magazine, so that was wonderful. I have to show this because it is typography, but I, I had a guy when I was still working in Mexico come in from uh, Cholu was it Choluca? Anyway, a little town outside of Mexico, and he was a pasta manufacturer, and he said, Mr. Wyman, I want you to do a logo for my, my, you know, my pasta factory. And so I talked to him, and I said, what's the name of it? And he says, La Moderna. I said, that has nothing to do with pasta. He goes, <laughs> he says, I know. And uh, he said, come on out. And he was just importing uh, all of these machines from Italy that made these beautiful shapes in pasta. So I went out and I saw this. So I transformed La Moderna into uh, La Moderna, the logo, the logo type, from, the, from these pasta shapes. At that point, he was just a little company. I think he's now the largest pasta manufacturer in the world. I think he's bigger than a lot of the Italian exporting companies in pasta. So I still keep in touch with the fellow's son that I did this uh, originally with. So it's, this, this was fun. I mean, it was a fun job. Um, Recently, let's see, 2014, I had uh, an exposition of my work at MOAC at the University of, uh, of Mexico. This is the, the new um, gallery museum they have there. And it was a real honor to, to have this. And uh, it had a lot of the things, the dimensional things, uh, a lot of the programs, they went into depth and talked about them. So it was a real magical experience for me. This is... Um, they did a, a book of 11 projects that I did in Mexico. Uh, if there are any left, this was carried on Amazon, so. <laughs> anyway, the, the cover of this was interesting in another way. I gave a talk in 1970, I think it was, at the Art Directors Club in Washington, D.C., and they did this as a poster. And now, we didn't have computers then, and I knew how hard it was doing that Mexico 68 poster and getting it right. And they actually did this by hand, and then uh, the Mexicans used it as a cover for the book. So uh, that, was, that was really quite nice. I'm, I showed these guys before. They came to the opening. Uh, Arturo, on, on the left, he was my model for all the uh, going up and down stairs. He's been going up and down stairs for almost 50 years now on, on these signs. <laughs> And he still looks the same. He gave me this. He, he had one of the, the original, uh, you know, uh, appliques for the no smoking sign. So he signed it. And that's him. <laughs> so uh, it, it was magical. I have to tell you. This was, uh, that's my daughter, the, the baby back at the Metro. That's her daughter, my granddaughter. And, uh, you know, and actually the poster that I did, the handout and the poster. This is interesting. This is, I did this poster for the... Um, for the show at MWAC, and it's, um, it's called Urban Icons. And, um, you know, when I did the poster, I thought, put these things in the space. And it was a very interesting experience because you can literally build up uh, space with things that you normally put out in space. And it, it was a nice play on all of this. And uh, that's the poster. And I used this uh, during that period of the exhibit also uh, for, I mean, SEGD is, uh, I was on the board for quite a few years and I just love the organization. And uh, they asked me to do the poster for their 40th anniversary. So I took the 40, I thought the idea of passing through with the four and the zero made sense. And um, so that's the poster. I used the colors that were developed by Pentagram. If you look down below, they did the, uh, the logo for SEGD. So I had my color palette was uh, quite good, uh, so that, that helped. So that's for that. Now uh, I'm working on a project that's called Alberto de Diseño, and it's the, uh, the open, the design open that's coming up in Mexico City. And it's in all the areas around the Zocalo and on the Zocalo. This is that, that square, the center I mentioned before. And um, I thought, you know, the idea of kind of playing with this idea of, uh, of the square. Now, okay, icons. We, we started with that rounded square for the Olympics, and now we all use it for all, all the icons on our apps and so forth. And so I thought I'd develop a typeface based on that. And 
put it into the third dimension, but have fun with it, putting it in the third dimension. So just by doing that, uh, it was possible to do things like that. You know, and it, 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 this thing has been so much fun. And, you know, then when you take that and put it together with itself, Alberto Mexicano de Diseño, and then use the type on an angle and so forth, there's a whole system there. And it's, it's almost like doing something out in the urban environment. You, you, you just do what you have to do to, you know, make it work. And it all looks like it's part of one thing. So this is still in the works. This was actually the first thing before I came out here. Uh, we just got this up on their web. Now they have the different um, areas of design. And again, using the A and putting it into that same spatial kind of relationship. So you can do it with typography and you can do it with icons. Well, I knew you could do it with icons because of that poster I showed you before. But so that's one thing that's happening now. Now, this, is, I, this was, I drove me crazy. I didn't think I was going to make it because I had to do the final uh, art for a map for this is the, uh, the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. Now, the Washington Gallery has a sculpture garden. I mean, the Washington, um, the National Gallery, I'm sorry, the National Gallery has a, sp a sculpture garden, West Building and the East Building. The East Building, of course, is the, uh, the I.M. Pay Building. So the map that they have now, it just puts it all down in a flat way and it's really hard to know how to get from one to the other. And you're not even sure that you're, this is one museum. I mean, it's just really hard. So what I suggested is that we take the site itself and put it into a, an isometric uh, so that you saw the relationship to the streets, to the environment, to the context of the museum, and that the gallery was one thing. And then the next step is to put it into its third dimension and, uh, you know, it's a very, very complex type of thing to do. So, uh, okay, so I kept it in pastels and kept it soft so that the information could be put in hard and you get all the icons so you know where the elevators are, you know all of the um, horizontal connections and you know all the vertical connections. So you can actually with, you know, a very complicated site, I hope you can navigate it much easier and at least understand that, uh, you know, what's going on. So that's, uh, that's the last thing that I've been working on. Now, let me just go back and I'll, I'll end by, by talking about the Mexico 68. I'll talk about the Metro. I am now working on a project with uh, CDMX, at CDMX, and it used to be DFE, District Federal, 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 Federal District. And, um, now they've, they've got a different thing. It's actually a city that has kind of the uh, statehood. It's like a state. And uh, they um, have me working on, uh, again, what I called urban image. And thank God I had that exhibit. So it really explained what the urban image is all about. So I mentioned before that the, uh, the Mexico 68 typography is a ligature. And I've never really seen that font used effectively in words because it, I, I just don't think it looks good in words. They're, the letters are too active. They don't look nice together. They look nice when they're combined like I showed you. So I thought, let's do a ligature face that you can type out in ligature format. So I developed this with the three lines where you only overlap one, uh, one line. And we're working on the technology now to we can actually type out your words and get the ligature uh, effect without uh, going crazy. And now this is interesting. This, this is um, sketches and taking that uh, three-line structure and making it into a, uh, a literal structure. In other words, taking um, structural elements and having them be made in the form of the three lines on their different faces and let them go through space to define sign shapes, to let them go through space to define uh, beams that hold up roof structures and so forth. So here the urban image is underway. We're, we're developing this now. And if it works, this is just a, a model of uh, one of the things that is part of it. And if it works, it'll probably be one of the first times that uh, literally typography steps into being a structural part of the city. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed on that one. Now, I know you guys are football fans. I'm going to end with a little football. Um, I did a lot of work during the 
1970 World Cup when uh, Pelé and that great Brazilian team won the cup. And I developed uh, Pico, which is um, a mascot for Mexico. And I, I thought, you know, they have an eagle the same as us representing the country. So I thought, well, why don't we birth the eagle out of a soccer ball? <laughs> now, the nice thing about this, uh, they do traditionally down Ray Farma, the main drag lights. And I had nothing to do with doing this, but they took Pico and he was all the way down Ray Farma. So that was uh, really beautiful during the World Cup uh, period in Mexico. Now, this is the book that uh, UNIT um, just came out with uh, not that long ago. And um, I, I just loved working with Adrian Shaughnessy and Tony um, Brook. And this is where I'm going to do a signing a little bit later tonight. And I have to show you something. When, when Tony and Adrian were at my studio, uh, my studio is still a recce. I mean, they, they pulled everything out of every place to get the material for the book. And we had a lot of fun because the World Cup was going on. So we'd go out to a, a bar, watch one of the games. But I had to get back and get a poster done within 90 minutes for a group over in Liverpool that had a designer from each country that was involved with the World Cup do a poster for their country's team, the result of the game, and you had 90 minutes to get it up. So these guys would still be drinking at the bar, and I was back working posters. I was very proud of the US team, I have to say. Uh, we, you know, we played Ghana. Thank God Ghana had some political problems because they were a very tough team and we beat them. And we were in that, if you remember the tough group, we were in with Germany, Belgium, Ghana, and Portugal. Okay, so we beat Ghana. Then we played Portugal. Um, it was like a humid, humid, humid jungle environment. We played Portugal and we tied them. So that was good. We're still alive. And we played Germany. And of course, Germany eventually won the cup. And we only lost one nothing, uh, so that was great. So both us and Germany got out of that group. And then we played um, Belgium in the knockout uh, round. <laughs> so that was the end of my poster career for the World Cup. <laughs> OK, that's the log books. If you see that, that row of black uh, books, this is in my office. and. Uh, Adrian really discovered them when they were uh, putting the material together for the, uh, the other book. And um, this is over in um, UK, in Sheffield. And they had an exhibit of the books. And, you know, it was one of those experiences. I mean, these things have been just part of my life for so long. And they set up a whole bunch of showcases. They, I think they photographed every page and they were projecting them on uh, windows of the gallery and so forth. And uh, it was like watching your life go past, you know, I mean, there were things there that I absolutely completely forgot about that never happened. And they were ideas that, you know, you love them at the moment, and then for whatever reason, they don't happen. So you kind of get off it and get on to something else. And it's quite an experience for me to go through the, um, you know, to see that was um, uh, New York block associations. Anyway, all of these sketches and early ideas are in these books. And uh, the books are getting old. Uh, they are old, in fact. I'm getting old, but I have gotten better with my posters. <laughs> I, I was, I, I, they asked me to do a poster for Obama for his uh, first campaign in 08. And um, again, that's my Obama poster. So I'm still doing it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very, very much. You know, I, I love if you have questions and don't be afraid. Anything you want to ask me, I, I'll do my best to answer because this is really the part that I enjoy most to see what's on your mind um, as far as what you're doing or what you might think I could help with or whatever. So please, um, we have two mics, one and two. Uh, so if you have a question, just go up to the mic and ask me. Great. Hi. Hi. 
That is on loud. <laughs> um, my question for you is you did a lot of side work while you were down in Mexico doing the Olympics. And I was wondering, we all know as designers, there's a lot of times where people ask, can you do this for me? And some of it's pro bono. How much of that, I'm curious, was actually negotiated where you had income coming in? And how much of that was actually just volunteer work for the sheer love of what you were doing? It was, it was a combination. Um, I mean, I wasn't getting a lot for doing the Olympics, and uh, it was during that program. It's, a, it's, it's an interesting question, because I never really thought about it in those terms. Um, Ricardo Legoreta, which was one of the very prominent Mexican architects, was working with Luis Barragan and Matias Goeritz on the, uh, the new hotel, the Camino Real. And uh, I met him through Matias Goeritz, who was uh, organizing a sculptural program for the Olympic Committee. And I met Ricardo uh, with the idea of doing graphics for the Camino Real because a lot of the dignitaries that were coming to Mexico would be staying at the hotel. They were going to have it finished for the Olympic uh, period. So I, I met uh, Ricardo and fine, but I also had to show my work to Luis Barragan. So we went over to Luis's place and um, you know that famous room that has the staircase kind of going up the side of the wall? It was in that room, and I'm showing my slides, and um, there were, you know, the first slide was upside down, and th <laughs> this is a carousel tray, right? The second slide, they were all upside down. So, I, man, I was really nervous, you know? So Luis says, don't be, I know how to turn slides over too, so he turned half over, and I turned half over, and I, I made the presentation. And um, I remember uh, he, and, he and Ricardo helped me turn him over. And I remember having Ricardo come up to, um, was Miami, no, it was in Dallas. We had an SEGD conference and I introduced him. And I, I told that as my finest collaboration with architects you know, as a designer. <laughs> you know? But now that was a paid project uh, to get back to your question. Um, I think I did both. I remember I did, um, I did a couple of things for organizations that were, it was a children's organization, for example, yeah. And I mean, I'm kind of a design freak. I mean, if I have time and energy, I'll do anything, you know, <laughs> if I like it, yeah. So yeah, I did, I did both. Um, and um, I still do. Good. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, hi Lance. Uh, my name is Terrence. Um, this is really great work. I, I have to say that um, I remember your um, signage from the Minnesota Zoo from about 1988 when I was there, maybe. Um, but uh, I was curious if you had any uh, any failure stories that that you could share with us too. Uh, I do. You know, I was asked this in. Um, I did a talk at the Walker in Minneapolis, and that question came up and I couldn't think of anything. And uh, I, it was embarrassing, you know? I mean, maybe I kind of push those things out. You know, now that I have these uh, uh, design logs, all of that stuff is out there now. But Okay, I was doing a project, or I was part of a team doing a project up in Toronto, and it was for the underground, right? And I developed uh, a program based on Toronto Underground City, and I did a little chipmunk and I remember, I, I'll never forget this, I did a little chipmunk and in my presentation, I had a map of the city and I said, now here's where all the entrances are for the underground. And this little chipmunk popped up in all the entrances and it was very, very effective. And the program was called uh, TUC, Tuck. I didn't know Tuck was a suppository. <laughs> that was the end of my, my Tuck program, you know? It's not the end of it, though, because the, uh, the client, I just, it was last year, I got a little, little baby gold, solid gold coin from Canada, and they, they actually, it's embossed with a chipmunk. <laughs> so, I, I mean, this is, I don't, I'll never forget the program now, and I'll never, if anyone asks a question, I'll never forget that uh, that happened. <laughs> so, anyway, that, that, things like that do happen. Hey, I just had a question. Um, as you said, like icons have just become the norm now, but they get very systematized to the point that I find a lot of icon systems are pretty dull. 
My question in particular, though, goes back to some of those, the Mexican squares where a lot of the shapes were round, but an icon like the horse was almost composed entirely of straight lines. So I'm wondering if that was personal preference or do you think if that was more the tools you're using and like the tools we're using today? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think it has much to do with the tools. I think um, when you're developing a system, uh, there's a certain look that usually holds it together. You know, in a lot of, a lot of things, I use the background shape, like I showed you that rounded um, on, the, on the Metro M. Uh, actually, I didn't mention that, but the 68 radiating out to a certain point became the background shape for, for all of the cultural symbols for the Olympics. And that's one way of controlling things. The way that uh, you form the things usually do have a, it really usually does have a, a really big impact on what the look is going to be. And I always think of, a, of a, an icon, especially an icon system, as ha of having a lot of layers of communication information. And the form is certainly one of them. And uh, sometimes it's something I like. A lot of times it's something that I like because it's appropriate for what I'm trying to solve. So it's not just a personal, um, quirk on my part that I like square things or straight things or I love geometry and I think one of the quests that I've always had is to give geometry personality to make geometry communicate um, and I've been pretty successful at that so but it takes a lot of different approaches and a lot of different uh, contexts I think that uh, you have to weigh that uh, kind of an approach in. So just a quick follow-up so like the cricket is one of the more detailed uh, icons in, in the early system. Wait, I get a little bit closer. The, the cricket um, yeah. in yes, particular yes. has like two antenna. Yeah. And I'm just wondering how many versions do you think you might have done with that? Because even in the, the, um, the example where someone had made the poster, like the, the red poster with the bag, yeah. like that icon is distorted because it's so much more detailed than the other yeah. one. So I'm curious, like in that process, are you struggling with the detail? That yeah, yeah it, in? you do, especially in something like the, uh, the station icons for the Metro. In fact, you pick one that has detail, but it still maintains its geometry. Uh, if you look at Zaragoza, for example, it's a guy, Mexican guy on a horse with his horse stepping on a helmet, a French helmet, <laughs> you know? And I couldn't really do anything except a pure silhouette. And the interesting thing there is, uh, because of the background shape, I was able to sneak that in without having the simple geometry. You don't even notice it. So you can have variation within a system, but you have to have something strong enough to hold a system together. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question, actually. You, do you design icons? Uh, no, I don't. I just think like when, you know, referencing even like an iPhone, like we're now, or you see dribble, like websites, like everything's so systematized yeah. and it's easy to cut and paste corners and chop things up that sometimes I do wonder if it is more of a system to, symptom today of the tools we're using and recycling curves and, yeah. you know, in a way that if you're working more with your hand, you might introduce a little bit more variability, um, like I think a lot of the icon systems you showed yeah. did. Well, I, I think the bottom line is communication. I, I use the analogy of a joke. You, you've told good jokes and bad jokes. You know when you tell a bad joke, you know? You don't have to explain it. You can't explain it, really. I mean, it either communicates or it doesn't, period. Like yeah? <laughs> I have a question about your influence. So you grew up in the Midwest-ish area? No, I didn't. I grew up in, uh, I was born in Newark, New Jersey, You're, and I grew oh, up in right. Kearney, yeah. But you worked in the Detroit area? I worked in, in Detroit area. for about uh, two and a half years, yeah. So where you live and where you're designing, how much of an influence does that have as opposed to where you're educated? Oh, gosh, that's, a, that's an interesting and hard question to answer. I mean, I can speak from my own experience. I know one thing, when I went to Mexico, I was like a, like a, a babe, you know, I mean, I, I, I didn't know anything about Mexico, so it was like, I was like a little kid, it was like, a, I was like an open book, you know, open sponge, and I took it in, and I know that was easier than working in New York for me, because I know so much about New York, and you get, uh, I guess what happens, you get attitude, you know, not, not good attitude, you get attitude that kind of gets in the way, and when I went to Mexico, uh, I just, 
saw things that were kind of amazing and I was able to bring that into the work. What was a stronger influence? Like where you were at the time or like if you're looking at I think, the, that I think area. the best influence, I, I don't think there is an answer to that. I think the best in influence is you yourself and it's just a matter of showing up. I don't think it has to do with the place as much as it has to do with you, the person. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna, beginning to worry about microphone yeah, number one. Right, no here. one's coming up front. Uh, I'm going to segue that question as I was sitting over here thinking about my question. I'm like, well, that's perfect. I might as well get up now. Uh, so there's a lot of young people in the audience. There's a lot of students here with us today. I'm an educator, so of course I'm thinking about them. And my idea, when I talk to the students that talk about their, their design voice, their style, mm -hmm. and finding their own style. So when we look at your work, it's very Lance Wyman, no matter what we see. We see all of your work having harmony, although it's also separate and beautiful in itself. So as they're working towards uh, graduating their degree, what kind of... Um, inspiration or talk would you or message would you have for them so that they're working out who they are as a designer and who they are as, as their own style and then as they enter, enter that work world and not have that that fear or courage uh, yeah. to face it. No that's a that's a difficult question I mean it's it's uh, I, I taught at uh, Parsons for 40 years in New York I just stopped in about two years ago now because I, I just couldn't keep up with everything that's happening in my, my life and my career right now with all of the books and so forth. But I think getting back to that attitude thing, uh, I mean, what, what I think is really important is to not have attitude. And I think um, attitude is, takes a lot of forms. Um, I even think of fear as being an attitude. You know, if you, if you have fear, you're really stopping yourself. Um, if you have attitude about people, you might not get on so well in a particular environment. Um, and I think along with that, it's just a matter of following your nose. I mean, you kind of, we all know what we like to do. I mean, I know what I don't like to do, and I get into trouble sometimes that I don't do that. Uh, but I mean, there are things you have to do. But I think basically in your career, in your chosen path of what you want to do and what you want to make your, your life uh, path from, um, I think following my nose and just not, not trying to have a negative attitude about things. Just uh, don't, don't give up. I feel like I'm an Olympian now. <laughs> but it's so true. I mean, it's really true. And I mean, I've had a lot of hard times. And I think it's, it's really up to each of us to find a way of kind of navigating those hard times, you know. So, I mean, I can't give any more advice than that because... I certainly don't want you thinking you have to do what I did or, you know, want to do what I do because we're all very different and uh, I just love seeing people do things in a creative way. I will say one thing, and I think teaching has been difficult in a lot of ways because I think now with all the data, with all, I mean, I'm, I'll never forget when the computer first came in. I mean, boy, you and you could put shading in the Illustrator I and mean, everyone was doing shading and they thought they were geniuses. <laughs> don't, don't get snowed by the technology. Use it, but don't, don't think you're creating something. Um, it's like, you know, typists became designers when, when they first came in with the computers. And, uh, you know, design is a very, very, very delicate part of our social structure as far as keeping quality, as far as keeping both quality communication and quality image, quality relationships. I mean, there's a lot of things that we can contribute to and if that type of area interests you, go for it and find a, find a place to do it, you know. And don't get, um, don't get yanked around too much when you get out of school. I see so many students, they get out of school and they do good work in school and all of a sudden they're working with a client or something that starts telling them what to do. You know, be careful of that. You don't have to be yanked around. You can leave, you can be aggressively confronting something. Try not to get yanked around. It doesn't mean you have to go out and be uh, Donald Trump or something, but I mean... Uh, <laughs> okay. Hi, I've got a question about, uh, about architecture. Get a little closer because I have a hard time here. I've got a question about okay. architecture. 
Um, yeah. Have you ever wanted to be an architect? You've always, uh, you've done a lot of great work, uh, design work in 3D space. Uh, did you ever at some point, or maybe here in the future, want to jump into more architectural-based projects? Um, I would say probably 95% no, but there's that 5% <laughs> that I love working with architects. I've done, when I was studying industrial design, I did a mobile home at Pratt, and it won an, an honorable mention in a national contest as a student, and it was open to, you know, uh, there's a part of me, I think, if I would have had the choice when I was looking at going to college and everything, I might, I might have chosen architecture. I wasn't thinking in those terms. That seemed like a more elevated uh, profession, especially back then. And, uh, but I would say no, I'm happy doing the dimensional communication. I think that really, that fuels me in a different way. And I think good architects know how to do that too. So. Uh, I like to, I mean, Ricardo Legarete in Mexico, I mean, he was just so beautiful to work with because he, he integrated as part of his uh, architecture, you know? Yeah, that's great. So, yeah. Personally, Thank though, you. no. <laughs> <laughs> this microphone's looking lonely up here. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming out. I, I really enjoyed this. Um, I think one of the most impressive things about your work is that it has that physical presence. It has that third dimension to it. Um, you go from a logo or a symbol and a person can then walk into a structure, or use it as a sign, and, and that's just amazing to me. How do you, when do you make that jump to the third dimension? Is that plan at the beginning or does that kind of get legs throughout the process? You know, that's, a, that's a, it's an interesting question because I never had that asked so directly because I didn't jump from graphics into 3D. I studied industrial design, so I jumped into graphics, so to speak, you know? And I think the thing that puzzled me was that graphic designers, we all live in a th three-dimensional world, but so often there's not any knowledge or any interest in the third-dimensional world. You know, it's either publications or posters, at least it was when I was going through the whole thing. And, uh, now that's changing, and I, I, I just love it. And I have to say, I, I love the exhibit that you guys have here, the type, type director's um, exhibit. And I've seen, uh, the, I think it was the last book that was done in New York in the type director's club. And I just love the experimental stuff. I mean, I think typography now is becoming a bigger part of communication. It's not just typography for typography's sake. And I think there was a lot of that going on. Uh, not, not completely, of course, but now, it's, it's a more integrated uh, part of the endeavor of typographic design and it's conceptual problem solving and it's graphic communication. And you know, that's a different, different ball game. I mean, a lot more can be done in, I, I love working with typography. I never just, I never just, I never thought of being a typographer though, because I wasn't, and I, I still am not in that sense, in the strict term of typography. I mean, there's a whole world of typography that I mean, I don't uh, get so involved with it because it's very intimidating for me. I don't, I don't understand a lot of it. But I do understand the communication part of it, and I do understand the, the finesse of refinement, which I think is very important. There's a lot of things that are important that uh, I do understand, so, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, just wanted to ask you, Lance, that uh, obviously the current Olympics has just come and gone. Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed to me that with the 68 Olympics, you had an immense amount of freedom. And you seemed very inspired by the idea of kind of going into a situation where you weren't 100% sure what was going on, but there was this freedom and to be very inspired by the culture around you to, you know, to develop something that you kind of seem to have carte blanche to create. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that even by looking like at what had happened with the recent Olympics with Rio and maybe even in London prior to that. Do you think that there's an element of things being co-opted almost like designed by committee that almost without having that sense of freedom, things are becoming almost too compromised? Uh, absolutely, yes. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I think the Olympics themselves have changed quite a bit. And I think a lot of reasons for that. I mean, the coverage, we were the first Olympics to be covered um, on television, actually. Um, 
And I remember making a presentation in Washington for the Bicentennial, and the fellow that was in charge of that was formerly with ABC, Channel 7, in New York. And uh, I got to the Olympic part, and he says, Lance, you just show the pictures and I'll tell them what it's all about. And he did. And I had no idea that what we were doing in Mexico was being seen here, you know, like that. And I think now, I mean, you know, you're, you're with someone and uh, 10 minutes later you're on Facebook. I mean, it's like all over the place quickly. You know, it's a very, very different type of environment now. The other thing is, is I think uh, we were less commercial. I think when the Olympics started becoming commercial, there's a control factor when you are sponsored very heavily by, you know, a commercial entity. And I think also, uh, one thing that we did with the games themselves is create a sense of place. I think now that's being done at the opening and closing ceremonies, but it's more like being invited to Cirque du Soleil to say, you know, this is London. Or, you know, and it, it, it's different because it takes away from the games. I, I love the Olympic idea and, and the games themselves. And I'd like to see them be a more powerful force. Uh, as far as the graphics are concerned, I think the reasons I just mentioned uh, have a lot to do with pulling away the, you know, the, uh, the interest in the graphics for the games themselves. There are a lot of other things that the graphics are uh, part of. Um, but yeah, there is, there, it, I think it's always a struggle, you know, and um, I, I just hope that they come back more to the Olympic programming that came out when Pierre Coubertin first started the modern Olympics again. You know, and that's, it, I mean, I could go on and on because there's a lot of pieces that we're talking about here, but to answer your question, yes, it's harder to do the Olympics now. And uh, that's some of the reasons that I'm aware of. Thanks. Can I go home now? <laughs> <laughs>